Okay, so we're coming to our final talk uh, from today. Uh, this is Mark Handover from Mentor Graphics. Mark is the European Applications Engineer for Digital Design and Verification Solutions. Um, he has been involved in design and verification of complex SOCs for over 20 years and uh, he has worked as an Applications Engineer with Mentor Graphics for the past 15 years. Um, we'll hand over to Mark now. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, uh, this talk is actually based on a paper uh, that uh, was presented by a colleague of mine uh, in conjunction with Continental on some work we were doing with the customer there on uh, fault injection uh, using formal techniques. Uh, it's actually centered around the uh, verification of the safety mechanisms themselves, as we'll see, um, so nicely teed up by uh, Jorg from the last presentation. Uh, so, as we've heard a number of times, uh, this is all about functional safety, uh, try, trying to ensure uh, the absence of risk uh, due to malfunction of uh, systems. Uh, ISO 2662, uh, one of the primary objectives is fault tolerance, as we've heard, um, and it's really to try and ensure that the system, uh, in the presence of fault, recovers uh, into some uh, regular functional behavior or moves to some fail-safe state. And the way we do this, uh, typically in hardware, is to provide a hardware-based uh, safety mechanism. Uh, of course, introducing hardware, we need to have verification, validation of that hardware. Uh, and so, in order to prove uh, that safety mechanism works in the presence of faults, we have to have faults. Uh, and so, uh, the standard uh, actually calls out specifically fault injection as a technique we can use to do that. So uh, just to recap uh, on what we've already heard, uh, we're talking about random faults here, uh, so physical defects in the design uh, rather than systematic uh, faults from uh, bad functionality, <coughs> uh, so bugs in your RTL, for example. So we're talking about random faults. And the purpose of the safety mechanism itself is to control those faults. Uh, so to trap those faults, detect those faults, trap them, and then provide a, a correct reaction, deterministic reaction to those. Uh, so be it to recover, as I said, to some uh, regular functional capability, so to detect a fault and make sure the fault doesn't propagate and cause any bad functional behavior, or to go to some safe system state, raise an alarm, uh, or such like. Um, and so there's two aspects to the safety mechanism we need to, to be aware of in terms of verification. One is completeness, so obviously it needs to be able to detect and track and trap uh, every fault, uh, all possible faults, and to obviously then behave correctly as well, so do the right thing. Uh, so trap the fault and then go to that safe state or uh, trap that fault uh, and stop it uh, ver uh, messing around with the functionality of the design. So we're going to use an illustration. Uh, this is what was uh, used in the basis of the paper at DBCon. Uh, so it's an SPI open core, uh, SPI master. Uh, so we have three main blocks in this SPI core. We have an AHB interface uh, and a serial interface. Uh, and then at the top there, we can see a clock generator. And it's the clock generator we're interested in in this example. So we're going to assume there's faults in the clock generator itself. Uh, that's where we're going to focus our efforts here. Uh, and so what we don't want to happen uh, is a fault in the clock generator to propagate itself through the block, out of the outputs, through other logic, and then eventually to the outside world. We don't want uh, the fault to affect uh, the functional behavior of the design. So we introduce a safety mechanism, some kind of hardware logic uh, that is able to trap the fault and then provide uh, the behavior we want. So whether it's to raise an alarm uh, or to, uh, to continue with good functional behavior. So the fault may occur, the safety mechanism will trap it and then do the corrective uh, good behavior that we want. This is a kind of high level broad view of what a functional safety validation may look like. Uh, so on the far left we have our design. So be it RTL or gate, <clears throat> we will have a number of fault points uh, in the design and then we'll probably go through some optimization phase. So we'll take the, the list of possible fault points and we'll optimize it somehow. We'll talk more about what that looks like in a minute. Then we'll have a modeling step in the middle uh, in the purple there. Uh, so we have to take those fault points, we have to induce some fault models. So we have to decide what sort of fault we want to model uh, and then model them, then inject them. So introduce the faults into the design. 
and then check that the faults don't have the bad behavior that we're trying to avoid. So try and understand uh, and check uh, the, the, uh, the evaluation of those faults through the system. We'll have some engines, uh, so be it simulation, emulation, or formal. Uh, we're going to talk mainly about formal in this presentation, uh, but you could use any or all of those uh, if they're available to you. And then obviously on the far right, uh, we'll need to measure what we're doing, and so we'll have some coverage metrics around those, and we'll merge them together if we're using multiple solutions. <coughs> so in terms of simulation, uh, you could use simulation, uh, as we've heard uh, before. Uh, it will suffer from the usual simulation problems of being potentially incomplete. It's not exhaustive. Uh, this was an example for the SPI, uh, where we took the SPI, uh, we introduced a safety mechanism, and then we ran simulation on it using constrained random. Uh, we were just using the stuck at one fault model. Uh, there were 372 faults introduced just at the cell output. And after a couple of hours, uh, we were around 67% of our targets. So we proved or was able to verify that 67% of the faults didn't propagate beyond the safety mechanism, so they were trapped. So we're kind of three quarters-ish of the way uh, on our test plan. Uh, but there's still work to do, and as you know with simulation, you can throw more and more vectors at it, and you hit some kind of point of diminishing returns usually, uh, and so <coughs> it leads us to formal as potentially a better model for verifying our safety mechanism. So this is conceptually what we're doing inside Mentor uh, with Quest of Formal uh, to do formal-based fault injection uh, for this kind of verification. So we actually have two copies of the design, uh, one in blue and one in yellow there. Uh, so they're exactly the same. Uh, they both have the safety mechanisms. They're just two copies. What we do is we inject faults into one of them, uh, and then we compare uh, the response from both designs uh, on the far right-hand side there with the check-in logic. So we use formal uh, to control, guide, and inject faults into the design, but into one of the designs. So we expect one to have a fault, uh, but the safety mechanism should pick that up, and then ultimately the outputs of the two blocks should be the same. So we have a fault point list, uh, and obviously that feeds into the formal flow as well. So we talked a little bit about fault points. Uh, where are we really looking? Uh, so if we take RTL, uh, it could be any of those uh, or all of them. Uh, you could have obviously input and output ports. We could look at internal signals. Uh, we could look at registers, memories, uh, RTL, Analysis is usually done for bug hunting, so you know we're trying to prove uh, functional correctness, if you like, of the safety mechanism. And then gate level uh, is more uh, towards the back end uh, when we're we're really trying to uh, get uh, final verification sign off for this. So in terms of RTL, it could be any of those. Uh, what we're seeing is customers are primarily more interested in registers and memories. Uh, obviously, through synthesis, internal signals can change or disappear. Uh, so that may not be the best candidate for a fault site, uh, but it may be interesting. And then at gate level, uh, obviously we're down at the cell level, so we're looking at pins and nets. So you can appreciate that the fault list may get quite large, uh, and so there's some optimization uh, or refinement that may be required uh, in order to make it a little bit more manageable. So you take a fault list, and there's some rules you could apply. So we're really talking about verification of the safety mechanism here. Uh, so you could just look at the cone of logic, the fanning cone for the safety mechanism itself. There's no need to necessarily consider all fault points in the entire design. Uh, we could just take uh, the fanning logic of the safety mechanism itself and consider that. We don't have to consider all nodes. We could start looking at excluding some. So we could look at internal cell nets and throw those away. Uh, we could look at things that aren't used. Uh, we could look at specific cells and include the, exclude those, such as buffers, for example. So they're kind of simple rules, and then we could use advanced rules as well. So we can use some formal technologies in advance of the verification to try and reduce the fault list. So we could look at uh, equivalent faults, so use DFT-type techniques to collapse the faults down uh, to reduce the fault list. Uh, and we could run uh, analysis, formal analysis of the faults to see if there's any that are undetectable. So because of the nature of the logic itself or the configuration, there may be faults that just can't be detected, they can't propagate, uh, you know, they're unreachable. Uh, so we could throw those away as well. And then we'll end up ultimately with some more optimal fault list uh, which we can work with. And this works for both obviously simulation and formal in this space. In terms of faults, uh, there's a number we could be looking at uh, and do look at. So obviously permanent stuck at zero, stuck at one, uh, fairly uh, straightforward. 
Uh, then there's transient faults, so more of the SEU, single event upset type faults, where you have some environmental or kind of a radiation effect, if you like, where you get some spontaneous flipping of state, uh, and it could cause you, obviously, your system to go in some erroneous uh, states. And then there's intermittent faults, uh, or kind of uh, repeated transients, if you like. So these ones that can kind of occur, uh, and then there's some time later they'll occur again. Um, so we can model all these in formal, uh, and this is kind of what they look like. So let me bring uh, all this up. So if you look at the top one, uh, we have permanent faults. So what we do with informal, uh, we have this control signal, uh, which is the blue line there. Uh, and uh, formal has control of this signal. Uh, so at an arbitrary time point, and this is where formal really plays very well, uh, we can just uh, introduce the fault at any time. So when this control signal goes high, uh, the tool is able to inject the fault and model that fault. And so in the green space to the left uh, before the fault, we're comparing two nets in the design, or two points, two fault sites in the design, uh, and we expect them to be equal. Uh, once we introduce the fault, uh, then obviously we can introduce a stuck at zero or stuck at one fault uh, in this case, and then we obviously expect those to no longer be equal. This arbitrary time point uh, is interesting. Uh, obviously, this is much more difficult to model in simulation, uh, but very easy to do in formal. So this is one of the strengths of using formal to do this. If we come down to transient, uh, then again, uh, we have this control signal, uh, which is formally controlled. Uh, again, it can introduce this at an arbitrary time, uh, but now also the duration can be parameterized or be an arbitrary time. Uh, so the length of the transient fault, uh, we can vary as well. Uh, so it's not fixed in time or for a duration. And then if we come down to intermittent, uh, it's uh, very similar. Uh, this time we have a repeated fault. So the number of repeats is obviously random uh, or uh, randomly controlled by formal. Uh, it's arbitrary. Uh, the time that they happen is arbitrary. And again, the duration of those pulses in this case is arbitrary as well. Uh, so we were covering all three bases here, stuck at transient and intermittent. So I talked about these faults, this, and some sizes uh, might be helpful for you to understand. Uh, so this was the SPI again, uh, so we took the clock gen, uh, we looked at faults in this, we introduced a safety mechanism, which is the TMR in this case, uh, so, so triple modular redundancy. And in terms of fault sizes, uh, uh, this is the kind of numbers that we were seeing. Uh, so if we look at uh, all nodes within the clock gen block, it was about 5.5k uh, faults. Uh, so you know, even for a small block, you can see the numbers are, are reasonable. And then there's various optimizations we can add. Uh, so if we just look at all nodes that are optimized for stuck at zero, for example, it's about 1.2. Uh, if we look at just all storage cells, it's very low at 57. So various levels we could apply optimization in order to reduce the fault list. For higher levels of uh, certification, uh, we may want to consider faults within the safety mechanism itself as well. Uh, so not just within, say, the clock gen block in this case. And obviously, then we expect the fault list to rise. It rises a little bit. Uh, again, we can apply some optimizations here. We may want to consider faults everywhere. Uh, so even if we have our safety mechanism at the kind of back end of the clock gen block, uh, we still may want to consider it faults in the entire SPI top here. And of course, the fault list explodes then. Um, so, you know, the SPI is not that big, uh, but all nodes is about, well, just shy of 30K. So, you know, a considerable number uh, when we think about verifying all of these. And again, optimizations are going to help uh, with the fault list. So we talked about the fault points. Uh, we talked about uh, the, the modelers, the fault models themselves, uh, and injecting the faults, and formal can control that. Um, so what kind of results should you expect to see? Uh, so what can we check here? Uh, so we take the two copies of the design, uh, we inject faults to one of them. Uh, what does this safety mechanism checker actually give us? So there's typically a number of results that you should or could expect to see. Uh, so the top one uh, is where the tool has injected a fault. So formal has injected a fault and everything behaves correctly. So the safety mechanism is catching it. Uh, it's not propagating, and the system's behaving as you expect it to. On the flip side of that, of course, is we inject a fault, uh, and the safety mechanism doesn't behave correctly. Uh, so the fault gets propagated. Uh, the safety mechanism doesn't do what we'd expect it to do. Uh, the system goes into some erroneous state. Mm -hmm. Those two are fairly straightforward. The second two there, the, the blue and the red uh, U there, uh, 
uh, is more about uh, kind of a coverage, if you like. Um, so what we want to understand is, okay, if I inject a fault, does it actually ever reach the safety mechanism? Uh, and that's what the, the top one's telling us. Uh, so the blue C is where there was a fault ejected and it was detected or observed. In other words, it reached the safety mechanism. Uh, this is independent of whether the safety mechanism was behaving correctly, which would be covered by one of the top two. And then the, finally, the bottom one is where we injected a fault, uh, but it didn't actually reach the safety mechanism either. So it was masked for some reason. Uh, it didn't propagate as far as we'd expect it to. So we can go in and obviously do some investigation here and figure out why. So graphically, what might this look like. Uh, so you end up with a counter example. Uh, so what we're looking at here in the waveform, uh, towards the top you'll see a yellow signal. This is our formal control signal. So this is the signal that tells the formal tool or tells the system when a fault's been injected. This is the signal that formal has control over. The red strobe uh, just beneath that uh, is the fault site itself. Uh, so this is, the red strobe indicates a difference. So obviously we're comparing two designs here. So if we open that out, that's two signals, so we can see there's a difference there, which is what we'd expect. So we're injecting a fault into one copy of the design, not into the other, but we're comparing those fault sites. So we'd expect a difference. And then coming down uh, where the blue arrow is pointing, uh, we're looking at the state mechanism inputs, and you can see that one of them there is different. Uh, you can see the red strobe there. So this is where the fault was injected and it propagated to the safety mechanism and so we can see there the fault is detected by the safety mechanism. Here's an example of a mass fault. Uh, so uh, again we can see the fault gets injected. We can see the red strobing indicates uh, that the fault sites have different values. Uh, so this looks like it's stuck at one and then we don't see any difference at the safety mechanism inputs. So here we're injecting a fault and it's not making it to the safety mechanism. So for some reason it's getting masked by the system. Uh, so we need to at least understand uh, what that case is. So you can see they all match at the, the mechanism inputs. And of course there's cases where we have to consider uh, that we may have a fault that originates outside of the scope of the safety mechanism. So the scope of the safety mechanism in this case is the clock gem block. The safety mechanism was designed to detect faults from the safety mechanism. There may be a fault from outside of there uh, and it may go through the clock gem block and it may go through the voting and they all vote the same way uh, because of the nature through the fault outside. And so we end up with a fault getting propagated through the system, even through our safety mechanism. And we need to be aware of and catch those as well, of course, and we can do that. So here you see an example where we have a fault gets injected. Uh, it reaches all three of the voters uh, on the safety mechanism inputs and even falls out the back of the safety mechanism as well. So we can see the fault gets all the way through the safety mechanism and beyond. Uh, so we see a difference coming out of the safety mechanisms for the two copies of the design. In terms of coverage, uh, so uh, just to show a comparison here, uh, the top one is simulation. Uh, so you can see we're some way off our goal here, running stuck at zero, stuck at one, and transient uh, single event upset type faults. And then at the bottom there, uh, this was for the FPI, uh, we can see that Formal was able to achieve 100% uh, coverage here. So just summaries. Uh, so the kind of summary here is that you know, safety mechanisms are typically small, typically small enough that we can run formal on them. Um, so formal is obviously uh, getting better and better at running larger and larger designs, uh, but the safety mechanisms themselves seem, you know, a good candidate for formal. Uh, fault injection uh, with formal is exhaustive as formal is, at least regarding the legal design inputs, uh, design space. Uh, but of course, uh, we have to bear in mind this time concept as well, uh, this uh, natural ability, if you like, of formal to be able to introduce this arbitrary time concept, uh, which is more difficult with formal. Uh, uh, and so the examples I've shown here, you know, Quest of Formal can help you reach those targets if you have a, a requirement in this. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to um, <coughs> Mark, who's our last speaker for today. Just ask if there's any questions. Yes, one question from Hi, I'm Dennis Eckel from the University of Southampton. Um, the uh, clock block is a bit special because it's, all, it's an output rather than input output block. But even so, um, my instinct would be that the most likely failure mode would be a partial failure of the output driver pin as a result of ESD in this sort of system. Um, 
and so I'm a bit surprised that the safety mechanism appears to only be a flow through from the clock logic towards the pin. Um, I would have thought in this particular case the most important aspect would be to actually sample the, um, the clock driver wire itself and, 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 check for, uh, and check for clean signals actually on the wire. Um, and more generally, um, I was going to ask about the, uh, the intermittent faults. Again, um, in practical system design, um, one of the most catastrophic claims of intermittent faults are, again, high impedance or partially failed I.O. Um, drivers, which are likely to result in very high bandwidth noise um, on a pin, which for a variety of reasons is likely to overwhelm internal um, failure handling systems. So in the case of your um, intermittent faults, can you accommodate high bandwidth noise as the intermittent fault or uh, there seemed to be a sort of solid line after each pulse in the diagram which suggested that the maximum rate of intermittency was being bounded in some way that would stop um, the intermittence overwhelming higher level handling. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a very deep question. <laughs> Uh, I guess uh, my short answer is I don't know. I mean, this is this is what we've modelled here is kind of very simple models. We have the intermittent kind of transient uh, and the stuck at fault models. Uh, these are more than what they are. In terms of your first question, um, the fault list is is something we can source from the design itself, or you can supply anything you want. If we can find it in the gate, you know, there's no reason we can't introduce a fault. Uh, the example here was just introducing a safety mechanism as a point of reference. It's just an example. Um, we don't actually need a safety mechanism. You could run the same fault analysis on the design without the safety mechanism. It's a bigger state space to accommodate, uh, but we can do that. We have done that with the formal tools. Um, so I think uh, you know you can you can aim the tool at the safety mechanism or other parts of the design, and you are able to specify that up front. Um, and, and guide it where you want to verify. So yes, it may be that you know, it's better suited. Uh, if you can model uh, a different type of fault, if that's what you're interested in, um, then you can do that. The ones we were looking at here, uh, they're automatic in the tool. There's no reason you couldn't expand that or modify that yourself or you create your own fault models if, if appropriate. Does that even slightly answer your question? Yeah, well, um, I was going to ask about um, um, high bandwidth intermittent faults um, where transitions are happening possibly fast compared to some of the underlying clock frequencies? So formal is, uh, is geared obviously to a clock pulse. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, this is using fundamental assertion technology, so it's, it's based on the clock. So you could run the formal verification clock at very much higher if you wish to try and see, uh, but then you're going to clock the whole entire system at that frequency anyway. You may be able to play around with a formal clock you know, some virtual clocking. Uh, yeah, potentially there's things you could do there. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mark. No handles. Uh, there's a question online. Uh, this is from uh, Renewable. Has this been analyzed? Sorry, has this been applied with DO254 projects? If, if so, how would you deal with certification authorities? Uh, at the moment, I think we've only worked with automotive customers on this. Uh, we're working with a number, uh, so Continental with the, with the partner uh, that developed this paper with us. Um, there's no reason it couldn't be used in DO254. Uh, you know, there's similar requirements in, in many places. Um, in terms of certification, um, it depends what aspect you're looking for, I guess. I mean, the flow and the aspect and the verification adds to the ultimate certification. If you're talking about tool qualification, uh, then it's similar to what uh, was it, uh, John from Keynes was talking about earlier, in which you know DF 254 has tool certification or qualification uh, problems, if you like, or challenges, uh, as does uh, 2662, um, but they're handled in much a similar way. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you.